I'll be talking about measuring end-to-end -end security. So this is the result of a, a conversation. You know, it, it was came from a conversation I had with uh, our CISO and one of my other uh, coworkers, Devit. Um, and so just a little bit about me. I'm the head of security engineering at Twilio. That includes uh, product security, uh, cloud security, corporate security, and we've just added automation engineering to that as well. So we're trying to automate a lot of our processes uh, too. Uh, before that, I was a startup architect at uh, T-Cell. I've also done uh, director of security for acquisitions at uh, Salesforce. So a lot of work with smaller companies and bringing them up to uh, a higher security standard. Uh, Devit could not join us today, uh, but he is a principal security engineer at Twilio. Uh, before that, he was an architect for both uh, software and security. And uh, you know, he comes from a, a background where he was a good developer, whereas I was the bad developer. So you get both those sides and both those viewpoints in this uh, presentation. Um, and so the question uh, we wanted to answer was like, how do we know our security program is working? Uh, what, else, what other measurements can we add? Um, so in this talk, we're going to talk about uh, you know the Twilio's SDL, uh, our metrics that we you know started with, uh, then uh, bug postmortems. This is a process we added. Uh, I don't think it's especially new or interesting, but we're doing it in a very interesting way, I think. Uh, and then some new metrics that come out of that, uh, and then we're going to talk about end-to-end -end security. So this is our you know uh, process that's built around. Uh, Th threat modeling. So we're not going to go through threat modeling. That's another class. Um, but this is things that get added on to threat modeling that allow you to sort of measure your progress there. And then uh, those metrics. And then if we have some time, we'll talk about where we're going next. So our current SDL is, or our previous SDL, uh, is has you know secure developer training. So people join the company, they go through secure code training, they go through security awareness training, um, and then as part of the process, we have threat modeling that we go through with the teams, uh, depending on when you know uh, what they're releasing and what features and how sensitive it is. Uh, we do you know you know hundred releases a week, sort of similar to the Slack team, um, and we are uh, we just don't have time to block those. So. Uh, we have a very rolling threat modeling process, and that is made possible with the security champions. So each team has a designated security champion on it that works with us either uh, biweekly or triweekly, uh, and we meet and t discuss the features that are coming out, security concerns, and if they have any security debt. Uh, and so this feeds into the sprint planning and the secure development, uh, and then uh, we have a secure deployment process. So this will include things like making sure that when they deploy these microservices out, uh, that they're secure by default, uh, that we've done everything to make it as easy as possible to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing. Uh, from there, we have uh, regression testing, which means like any bugs that got out into production before, uh, we have tests in place for them. We do run that nightly. Uh, and then we have static dynamic testing, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. We run several tools from third-party vendors against our code and against the site itself. Uh, including like you know, OSAP, and just to make sure that we're covering as much as possible. And so for our continuous stuff, we have uh, pen test and bug bounties. We have an open bug bounty. Uh, anyone can sign up and uh, take part in it through Bug Crowd. Uh, it's produced some good results. And then we do also do annual pen test uh, for the various products we run. And so uh, the traditional metrics when we came in and we started discussing this was, you know, number of bugs found over time, say in a quarter or a year. Uh, we talked about the number of tools that we were running. Uh, and then we talked about, like, you know, what percentage of training coverage for engineers, uh, annual pen test coverage, you know, software that passed our security gate, or really it's a license to release to production since we don't block it, uh, and the number of compliance uh, standards that we've achieved. And so that, that's a good start, and we should be tracking these things. There's nothing wrong with those metrics. Uh, and you'll come up with like, all right, this is uh, red, yellow, green. Uh, my security program's doing okay, right? I mean, uh, but, you know, three tools, three compliance standards. I, I'm doing pretty good on uh, annual pen test coverage. Uh, so what happens if I get to my, my goal, right? Like, what does that mean? I, I, I can go home. I can actually sleep at night tonight. Uh, that's going to be great. Like, am I 
bugs might still show up, but I'm doing everything I can, right? Uh, if, so you may think you're doing some things right, but uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, we want to prove it. Uh, so to illustrate this, we have two teams, one that has an SDL and one that doesn't. Uh, and we chart the number of bugs found over time. Uh, and so uh, depending on how you look at this, you could say team A is doing better because they're reducing the number of bugs uh, that they're finding. Uh, you could also say team B is doing better because the total number of criticals is, is actually smaller than the team A's. Um, and just to you know, make it even tougher, what happens if, when this happens? You have one with an SDL and one without, and they both have the same number of bugs found. Like, is your SDL doing anything? How do you know? And so uh, we want to talk about you know, what evidence is it, can we do to show that we're getting better. So the argument is we can, we can measure bugs found. Great. Uh, I'm going to change the bug bounty to pay out $5 per bug. Uh, and we'll hire a cheap pen tester. I will have no bugs found. And I'll look great. Uh, and the reason is I don't want uh, this situation where the bugs created you know, two years ago uh, the feature is released. Uh, I add in my SDL improvement, start tracking metrics, and all of a sudden this bug's making my metrics look bad. And so uh, the concept here is finding security vulnerabilities is not equal to a failure in our SDL. It's good. We want to get better at this. We want to find more. We want to add more. But we have to decide, like, what is a failure in our SDL? And so we started categorizing our metrics. So we have uh, security coverage. We have security outputs and security effectiveness. Uh, our security coverage is how much of the organization are we covering? So this is like percentage of developers uh, that we're training. Uh, it could be percentage of products, uh, products that we've addressed that we're actually interacting with. Um, really, it's you know, how much uh, coverage do we have? And then we'll talk about outputs. So naturally, when we put these processes into place, there will be outputs from these things. Tools will find bugs, so we track the number of bugs. Uh, we'll talk about the number of developers reaching out to us from the security team. This shows sort of our engagement. Uh, and the number of uh, you know, issues or threat modeled issues, like how much threat modeling are we doing? What are their outputs? Uh, but there's really none of these show that the security program is actually working. We can put all this into place. We can get up to our goal level. Uh, but we don't know if our training is effective. We don't know if uh, our tools are effective. You know, something could still be failing here. And so uh, we really need more data. <clears throat> so to illustrate this, uh, we're going to take a stab at our first metric. Uh, and this is a, excuse me, a conversation uh, that came up as well as, why should a team self-report a security bug? We have you know, 50 teams. Uh, they're working on features. Uh, why should they self-report a security bug? Uh, it makes the product better. Yeah. That, you know, it makes Twilio more secure. Uh, but their incentive is uh, that their performance is based on how many features they ship, not how secure their product is. Uh, maybe there's a reward. So I run into this a uh, few times too, is we should you know, give a small reward to the developers for every security vulnerability that they, they report or that they report from another team. Of course, being professional gamers of the system, uh, we see you know, immediate problems with this as far as I'm going to stop talking up and you know, speaking up in the threat modeling. I'm going to wait till my product's done, and then I'm going to start uh, discussing these things. And so uh, I came up with the concept of really uh, developer security self-awareness. So this is, uh, we, we bucket the reported issues into three ways. One is, you know, they came up with the design in the architecture or threat modeling process, or it's been identified by the team during development before it reaches production, uh, or it's uh, identified after by, you know, third parties or pen testers. And so what we can see is as the developer gets closer to this, like, day zero, uh, as these teams do, uh, we know that they're getting more mature about their security, that they're finding these things faster. So we can compare that to bugs that actually reach out and get, you know, are found by, uh, instead by bug hunters. So to find this out, we're going to add in this bug postmortem process into our SDL. 
And so we're going to modify the bug postmortem process and modify a little bit of threat modeling. That'll be the end-to-end -end security part. Um, and so this is really about getting the data we need uh, to build better metrics. So the bug postmortem, it's traditionally been used just for incidents. Um, I know some people have also used it for like serious security bugs, uh, but I haven't run into an organization that does this you know, reliably. Um, we do it you know, every two weeks. Somebody on the security team is, everyone's assigned a bug and they uh, present for five to 10 minutes on that security bug. Um, and this, these bugs, at first, we narrow it down to things like customer reports, penetration tests, bug bounties, um, because just taking all the bugs from tools would be a little much. Um, as we get better, we might expand into the, the pipeline as well. Um, but we're gonna start with like, you know, highs and criticals, not every single bug either. And so what are we gonna be measuring with this process? Uh, well, the first thing is, when was the bug introduced? So we're either gonna dive into GitHub or we're gonna die, you know, talk to the developer teams and we're gonna figure out when was this bug born? How much would we have paid a bug bounty researcher for this? So instead of like using a, this is a P0, P1, uh, we're gonna assign a number. So we're gonna go through our taxonomy and say, you know, if this was reported by a third party, how much would we have paid? How much engineering time did this consume? So then fixing this, how, how long did that take? A couple days? That's time that could have been spent developing features instead. And how much security time? Uh, my, team's, my team does not work for free. Uh, the more bugs that we have like this, the bigger my team has to be, the more it costs the organization. So these are important things to track. Uh, the questions we want to ask are, you're really like, what area of security was affected? Uh, so that's like, Authentication, authorization, was it output encoding? Um, what feature caused this vulnerability? We match it up to a JIRA ticket. Uh, what part of the cycle was this found? You know, was it code check-in? Was it bug bounty? Uh, was it a failure of the in-place SDL? So not just our, like, you know, all the SDL, it's the SDL that was in place when that bug was born because we didn't add the entire thing at once. We pieced it in over time. So was this really a failure of some part of that SDL? And then was it a failure of uh, training, design, development, or the pipeline? And if it's a failure of the pipeline, it was probably also a failure of one of the others. So it can be a combination of these things. And was it found uh, live, stage, or check-in? We want to know. And uh, of course, what would need to change? So this is our root cause analysis that we do. Um, and as I mentioned, as the bullets were going by, uh, the estimated bounty is greater than priority. So we found that it makes a lot more sense for us to judge um, the importance to us based on our taxonomy and how much we would pay uh, you know, a theoretical researcher for this, as well as if it gets reported by a bug bounty, we already have that number easily available. And so this is a small example. I threw in some uh, sanitized data in there of uh, some various bugs. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and, you know, we, this is what a, you know, a, a few weeks might look like as we find some failures of development and, uh, you know, the pipeline and design. Uh, and we notice that the bugs were born uh, at various times. So it's not like these were immediately, they were all at the same time and we had all the same failures at the same time. So knowing when that bug is born is really key. Uh, so we have, uh, so here's an example. I took the last set of data and I'm gonna bucket the number of bugs found. Uh, and I'm gonna say in a feature. So for this, we're gonna say features with critical vulnerabilities. So the numbers are number of features that have one or more vulnerabilities. Uh, and we'll keep it to uh, criticals and highs as well. And then we'll have the number of developed features in that time span uh, and the bug bounty total that we paid out during that time span. So are we producing bug, more bug-free features? Uh, even if our bug count was going up during that time, we may find that uh, during that time we were shipping fewer and fewer bugs. We also might wanna know, are we finding bugs faster? Uh, the lifetime of the bug is pretty important. So are we reducing the time it takes to find that bug from say a year down to uh, immediately after it hits production? Uh, and so we can also track that using uh, that, that uh, bug postmortem information. Uh, 
Also important is, you know, what parts of our SDL need to be improved? So, you know, so in the postmortem, we asked what failed. Uh, and so we can map these numbers out to, um, you know, what parts of these failed, uh, you know, what feature shift would fail, uh, failed things, and then we can sort of map that out with a trend line over time. Say, okay, failures of dev training, that's going down, that's good. Failures of development, that's going down. Failures of pipeline tools, uh-oh. So even if uh, the total number of bugs went down, uh, com if you combine these graphs, uh, the failures of design actually went up. Uh, and so we can see we have a problem there. And again, these are when the bugs were born, not when uh, they were found. And so this brings us to our first uh, security effectiveness metrics. Uh, the first one we talked about was the self-awareness. Uh, the next one would be the, the bounty cost per feature. Uh, we have a bug survival rate, so that's how long it's in production. And then we have our process failures. And so now we can take that uh, bug postmortem process and feed it back into the SDL. So we modify secure developer training, we modify threat modeling, we modify like our interactions with security champions. We use you know checklist of what what's going wrong, um, so we can modify like the top things we ask them about during our meetings. Uh, and then of course, anytime there's one of these bugs in production, we modify our regression testing as well. So one thing that comes up is, uh, won't those stats continuously change? So the more I find bugs, uh, that you know, four month period may change. Uh, there may be additional bugs found because there, there'll be a bugs born in that period that we didn't know about. Uh, yes, and so for that we use uh, a beta distribution. And this is actually based on uh, our code written by our, our CISO, uh, Richard Sarson. Uh, and so you can actually uh, go online and check it out and modify it for yourself. But we continuously update this uh, with the information to compare our beliefs, which maybe like 10% of the features will ship with, with uh, a, have a higher critical at some point in a lifetime, and say we're like 90% confident, 20% of the features or less uh, will have a higher critical. And so we continuously add to this, um, uh, this data, and this just gives us better information. So beta distributions are based on uh, hits and misses in statistics. So for hits, we use vulnerable features, and for misses, we use a uh, feature without uh, a vulnerability. Um, so next is the end-to-end -end security. So we wanted to find out uh, not only like are we getting better, but how well is our threat model actually working? Uh, and how, you know, how effective has it been? So for this, we, you know, we came up with sort of the idea of a perfect system, which is you know, all features are threat modeled, uh, every serious attack's been defined, uh, all attacks are monitored, uh, all serious attacks have controls, they all have, uh, you know, all these controls and monitors have continuous tests. Uh, that's our nightly test that goes out and actually tests this production for these things and validates they're working. Um, and because of that, we can stay with confidence that these controls and detections are effective. Um, so to illustrate this, I came up with a really bad application, uh, but we're gonna you know, sort of go through the process with this one. Uh, what's happening here is I'm gonna write something on, say, Heroku, uh, that has an app server, and it's gonna call out to, uh, you're gonna log in with Google OAuth, and give it permissions to get your calendar uh, so it can see who's invited to the meeting you're currently at. Uh, then you're gonna cross-reference that with the company directory, which is just a direct database access because you have really bad security. Uh, and uh, you'll store that OAuth token and some profile information in a database for that application. Uh, there's also this microservice down at the bottom, uh, which does some automated querying and says like, here are the people you're gonna be in the meeting with today. Ah, so where do we start? We start with uh, really the PII inventory and usage. So this is all personal identifiable information. Uh, our business case, our business assets and worst case scenarios for each of those assets. And our uh, you know, service connections. So the other microservices we talk to or that talk to us. 
and uh, descriptions of what data is flowing between them. And we're going to feed that into our threat model. And threat models, like, unlike whiskey, can be blended, and you shouldn't feel bad. Uh, so use whatever works for your organization. Uh, it could be stride. It could be you know, attack trees. Uh, the important part is uh, what's going to come out of this is a series of attacks that we'll work with. So the assets are going to be you know, our PII. We're going to have names, emails, uh, and you know, our location, because we have that calendar information. Uh, our business assets are going to be our company directory and the Google Auth keys, and so we come up with like some worst case scenarios for those. And then we talk about you know the different services we talk to, uh, Google Calendar and you know the microservice uh, actually talks to us. And so uh, since we have this information for a lot of our microservices, and we have a lot of microservices, we actually wrote a really nice tool. So I'm going to sidetrack just for a second and talk about something David wrote, which was uh, Blackbird. And so this is an overview. We've sanitized the data a little bit here um, of our various products with each of their microservices. Uh, the globes are used for uh, anything internet facing, so solid dot for internal service. And then we, have, of course, have uh, you know, database icons, things like that. And I'll see if we can do a little demo of movie. I didn't want to do a live demo. Uh, so what we can do is we can like zoom out and move around uh, all this information that we've collected about the PII. Um, but we've also collected uh, how these services connect to each other. So we'll you know, drill into one of these services, and we can instantly get uh, its different connections to various other services. Uh, and this is all a result of information we gathered uh, with the teams during the threat modeling process. Um, we can also pick one of the products and then just see all the services it talks to as well. So we can narrow it down by product as well. As you can see, we have several microservices. <laughs> um, and so um, out of that, we, you know, that process of threat modeling comes um, our attacks. And so we define several attacks. Of course, these are not going to be all of them, but we're going to start with an example of somebody could modify their last name to be Garrett held script alert one script. Uh, and so when you log in and you see you have a meeting with Garrett, it shows that uh, JavaScript. So we have a potential cross-site scripting. Um, and then we're going to talk about a privilege one, which is we don't have any real logging controls. So an attacker could log into the application server, uh, grab the OAuth tokens out of the database, and just grab everybody's calendar details. And then we're going to go back to our bounty uh, idea and give each of these a bounty. So uh, since we don't have any central way of stopping cross-site scripting uh, you know, in, in the current design, we're going to say there could be up to two bounties there, like first name, last name. Uh, and then we could have, uh, you know, for the privilege one, that's not as, as big a deal. Let's say we gave like bug researchers access to our internal network and they reported that. Sure, we'd document it and give them like a $25 bounty for that. Uh, and now we're going to map uh, controls to the attacks. So for each of these attacks, we're going to, you know, set up some controls as far as like maybe we have the centralized templating library or strict CSP. Uh, and then we're going to have some detections. So that'll be you know, our CSP reports. Then for each of those, um, you know, we're also going to do that for each attack. And so there may be some overlap there between you know, attacks and controls. So it's going to be a mini-to-mini mini mini relationship there. And so let's say that like the strict CSP one, we say it reduces the bounty by $800, because like, that pretty much eliminates you know, the cross-site scripting for if we get a really good pro uh, content security policy in there. Um, but the cost of the control to implement is around $10,000. Development time, you know, research, security time, we make rough, these are all just like made up numbers, rough guesses. Um, so we're gonna do this for each of the uh, controls and detections. So you may see that the bounties are, all these bounties are way less than the cost of controls. Uh, that is because the bounties are not equal to the expected loss of, of not having these things in place or of the attacks. Um, it's really about just a way of 
having something that's very meaningful, of, ma meaningful to us to compare to uh, the cost of the control. And we build up that ratio. Um, and based on that ratio, we can know what, what we're getting the best value for with our development time. And so we can make decisions here. So we're going to talk about, you know, this is required before the product goes out. Uh, this, you know, something might get backlogged or it might be iceboxed. Uh, the, the cost of control is way out of line with like a $25 bounty. Um, or it may just already exist. So we can document that as well. Uh, the other nice thing the, the bounty uh, theory gives us is uh, sort of a, uh, a way of determining uh, trusted relationships. So we have this microservice X that can contact us and through no fault of our own, it's got really terrible security and uh, it gets hacked and somebody now has access to all that calendar information and PII. Um, even though our, our service was you know, encrypting the tokens at rest, it had secure communications, it had you know, authentication authorization controls working, it really wasn't our fault. Um, so we have this like sum of uh, trusted bounties. And so we look at that network that we had up before and we can tell like how much uh, extra you know, bounty debt, I guess you'd call it, uh, are we adding to this app server? And so we, who should we really pay attention to here? Should we be talking to this team on microservice X and saying, you know, you need to stop like exposing your microservice to the public internet and pay, you know, uh, add some authorization controls probably or something like that. Um, but really uh, it's a way of development team saying like you're dragging down my security to another development team. And the last part about this is uh, validation testing. So here we just have like one validation test per control, per detection, uh, but you could have multiples. So uh, for cross-site scripting, of course, you'd, or uh, CSP, you'd want multiple uh, tests running every night to test that it's actually working. And what that's gonna give us is confidence in the fact that these controls and detections actually work. Uh, not that we just place them there, but that they are actually stopping attacks that we've scripted. And so you put it together and it sort of looks like this, uh, where we have like all this stuff feeding into the threat modeling process and it comes out of it as you know, these attacks that we can uh, sort of monetize with bounties and controls and detections uh, that are mapped there. Uh, and so we have things like uh, our flagship feature may have you know, 100,000 potential bounty, uh, it's residual bounties, like $25,000 after we put in the controls, uh, but the sum of its trusted bounties, $45,000. So it's got a much bigger problem trusting these other services that are insecure. Uh, whereas with the others, uh, their, you know, their bounties are much higher than you know, the, the systems they trusted. Um, but this tells us you know, we may have controls that we haven't put in place yet. And so which of those controls that we put in place is going to give us the best uh, amount of reduction for that residual bounty. And then uh, of course we have that column of validation confidence. So how confident are we that that is actually true and that we've actually uh, decreased the threat to this product? And so uh, we add in two more uh, security effectiveness metrics based on that is the potential bounty mitigation and our validation confidence. And so these uh, metrics together should be able to tell us, you know, based on the coverage, based on our outputs, uh, are, is our SDL effective? Is our threat modeling process effective? Um, and are, you know, how much are we improving? So you may have threat models in place, you may have controls in place, just because you add an, another control, how much more secure did that uh, make your company? And so without getting into, uh, you know, uh, actually I'll talk about that in a little bit, but. Uh, so what's next? Uh, it seems like uh, a lot of this could be automated. So you saw Blackbird, it hasn't been fully automated yet, but we're working on it. Uh, we intend to open source a lot of this stuff, as well as, you know, the ability for developers to just go in there and uh, enter in the PII that they're talking about. Uh, we work pretty closely with the legal team as far as uh, you know, when there's additional PII being used, we run it by them as well, so we serve a dual purpose there in case our privacy statement needs to be adjusted. Uh, so that's, that could be automatically triggered.
as well as uh, those many many relationships through attacks and controls, obviously that makes it for a great database structure. So. What else? Uh, we're quantifying the risk of our security work. So it's a little bit much for the granular like control and detection level. Uh, but if you put those together, you can talk about uh, threats to the organization and actually quantifying those. Uh, so this is a book co-authored by our uh, CISO. Uh, and from this, we can talk about like expected breach loss uh, based on these threats. Uh, one thing uh, I also like to talk about is expected loss of revenue from a lack of security features. And so we also work closely with our sales team to say like, okay, let's say we didn't have 2FA. Uh, how many enterprise customers are actually passing us by because of that? And so because of that security control isn't in place, uh, there is a breach expectancy loss from that control not being in place, but there's also revenue that we're losing from enterprise customers. And it's probably larger than the breach expectancy loss. Uh, we can also do uh, security bug survival analysis. So we had like our bug lifetimes and are they getting shorter? Uh, but based on the features that we're producing and how long those bugs are actually surviving, uh, and we combine that with our beta analysis of like how many bugs are probably actually out there right now that we don't know about, uh, we can you know, map out how long those bugs are probably gonna be you know, surviving out there. Uh, and then we have uh, you know, our experiments. So uh, you know, how long were the developers uh, with the company when they, uh, when they wrote the bug? Uh, this is a good one. We're also adding to the bug postmortem. So uh, have they been on the team or with the company for like less than six months? Uh, and then they, you know, by that time, they had figured out how to do things securely. Uh, so we could then like shift our focus to reviewing code by new members of the engineering organization. And so uh, key takeaways here are, uh, you know, nothing is wrong with the uh, existing metrics, um, but we want to categorize them. And we want to add to them uh, to tell, tell us, like, how am I doing? How am I doing at my job? And is it actually making a difference? I, I have security code training in place, uh, but it was the wrong training. So, uh, you know, it, that's going to result in more bugs that are a failure of that training being in place. Uh, and we also want to understand, sorry, uh, are we get, just getting better at bug hunting or is there a failed process in place? And so that's the part about the postmortem and knowing you know, when was that bug actually born. And then it may be useful uh, you know, uh, to measure progress by you know, these easily understandable things like bounties, which are a lot more meaningful uh, to both the security team and to others in the organization uh, than the abstract concept of you know, a high, medium, low risk to the organization. All right, that's it. Thank you.